So we um, continue moving um, down the elementary tract, but basically past mouth. Okay, we figured you know two main digestive activities going on there talking about mastication, or chewing, and salivation, which is an important component of chemical digestion. Breaks down carbohydrates and the enzyme called amylase and lipids by the lingual lipase. And here we enter into a pharynx. So pharynx is shown in basically the, the purple color here, okay? And it is bound by the nasal cavity, oral cavity, and larynx. Okay, so pharynx, we know it as a throat. Now, there are three parts to it. Okay. One part is called nasopharynx. It is closest to the nasal cavity, and the only function of all nasopharynx is respiration. As you move farther, you enter into the oropharynx. That's the part of the pharynx bound by the oral cavity, which participates in both respiration and digestion. That's where the food goes when you swallow it. And the last part here is laryngopharynx. Laryngopharynx is bound by larynx, its distal part, and participates in respiration and digestion as well. Now, why I focus so much on the differences in terms of the activities between these three parts. Well, if you think about it, laryngo and oropharynx participate in one activity that nasopharynx does not. It's a digestion. It means that these two parts get in physical, mechanical contact with the foot. And that determines the difference in the epithelial lining between oropharynx and laryngopharynx versus nasopharynx. These two, sorry, these two, oropharynx and laryngopharynx, are covered by stratified squamous epithelium. Makes perfect sense, since stratified squamous epithelium is found in the areas um, that are subject to the abrasion forces. Okay. Now, nasopharynx is covered by the pseudostratified columna. Same type of epithelium that you can find in a nasal cavity. Both these chambers, nasal cavity and nasopharynx, participate only in the respiratory activities. Does that make sense? Now, the main sort of, it's not kind of function, yeah, the main function of these two parts, pharynx, oropharynx and laryngopharynx, that we are interested in, right, because that's digestive kind of part, is what we call swallowing or deglutition. Now, swallowing reflex, swallowing is a reflex, which is initiated by the voluntary move. You understand, you can swallow when you want to, right? So, this it's the bolus of food, something that you chewed upon, and food particles are glued together by mucin that came from saliva. 
So this bolus of food is voluntarily forced from the mouth into the oropharynx. It goes right here. Okay, that's the voluntary part. Now, as this bolus of food enters oropharynx, mechanoreceptors in the soft palati and oropharynx sense the stretch. Before I move on, does that make sense? Think about swallowing. You push the foot back into the oropharynx and this tube stretches, right? So this stretch, this sensation of stretch, reaches the swallowing center, the medulla oblongata. Swallowing center generates a response, motor response, that reaches the muscle surrounding oro and laryngopharynx, stimulating propulsion of the bolus of food into the esophagus. Not only this, swallowing center sends the signals to the uvula, right here, to close nasopharynx, so the food doesn't accidentally go into your nose. And it sends the signal to the epiglottis, to the muscles that control epiglottis, to close your larynx, so the food doesn't get into your trachea and lungs. Does that make sense? So, then, as the food gets pushed through the oropharynx and laryngopharynx by the um, contraction of the skeletal muscles controlled by the swallowing center, the upper esophageal sphincter relaxes, allowing food to enter into the esophagus. Now what I want to do, this is a dedicated picture showing the entire swallowing process from your mouth all the way down into the stomach. So we're going to repeat it again. So here you can see a bolus of food. You see that upper esophageal sphincter is closed. As you push bolus of food back into the oropharynx, that stretch sends the signal to the swallowing center in the medulla oblongata, which in response closes uvula, closes epiglottis, and relaxes upper esophageal sphincter. So the food can be pushed by a peristaltic activity of your throat into the esophagus. Does that make sense? Since the food is normally supposed to go one way, from mouth to eventually anus, once the food enters into the esophagus, upper esophageal sphincter closes like a door behind the foot. In the meantime, Peristalsis in the esophagus moves the food bolus down into the stomach. As food approaches the lower esophageal sphincter, or as it is called sometimes gastroesophageal sphincter, it opens and allows the bolus of food to enter the stomach. Does that make sense? Now, this is the reflex that I absolutely want you to know, step by step. So, I will ask you the question, something in, in, the, in the matter of what are the proper steps of the swallowing reflex? And you will get several sequences and you will pick the correct one. Am I clear? So, the highlight of what I'm, what I want, what I want to highlight about this. First, this is the activity that starts voluntarily. Clear? Because you start swallowing voluntarily. 
Second, once the food is in the throat, the voluntarily part is over. Make sense? From that point forward, you cannot control anything that happens to the foot. I mean, consciously control. Everything else, opening and closing of the upper esophageal sphincter, opening and eventual closing of the gastroesophageal sphincter. All of these activities happen involuntarily. Are we clear? That's number one. Number two, this is a typical reflex arch. Stretch. That's the sensory part. Does that make sense? Stretch of the oropharynx. Are we clear? Via sensory neurons into the integration center. Medulla oblongata, which generates motor response. I'm going to call it propulsion. Okay, basically swallow. Yes. So when you said that you have a complete question and then you have a sequence of like bodies, would the <coughs> stretch and do what I'm about and propulsion be the steps? More detail. Okay. So say if I start, say you see five answers. If the answer starts with, I don't know, opening of uvula, it's definitely wrong. <clears throat> Even if it starts, <clears throat> if closing of uvula comes first, and food moves into the pharynx. Second, that's the wrong order. You have to know the order. These questions, unfortunately, these questions are very time consuming and inconvenient. I have to ask them though, because otherwise I would ask you to write down the whole shtick. And I think you'd rather pick the correct sequence. Okay? Does that make sense? So just read them carefully, just you know, take your time. I never push it in terms of time. Any questions on the reflex? Yes. We'll get to this. Basically, it's uh, medulla controls vomiting as well. Esophagus. Um, in my opinion, like, pretty boring part of the digestive system. It's a tube. Okay. Pretty long. Crosses diaphragm and enters its joints, stomach. Enters stomach at the cardial orifice. Okay. So basically if you would draw the esophagus like a tube, there are two sphincters. Now We mentioned in, you know, we ran into sphincters in AP1 in anatomy, anatomy of an eye. Um, sphincters that control the scleral venous sinuses, control the drainage of the uh, aqueous humor from the interior segment of an eye. Sphincter is the circular muscle. Does that make sense? That's it. It's a circular muscle. Uh, we had this also when we talked about nice sphincter pupillae, the muscle that controls your uh, constriction of your uh, pupils. So sphincter is the circular muscle. When sphincter, uh, when sphincter contracts, its diameter decreases up to a full closure. When it relaxes, diameter goes up, sphincter opens. Are we clear? So... If we would draw this as the esophagus, this, is, this will be upper esophageal sphincter separating pharynx and esophagus. And this will be lower esophageal sphincter or sometimes called gastroesophageal, meaning sphincter between gastro, stomach, and esophagus. 
okay? Now, unlike some other layers of, um, unlike other parts of the digestive alimentary tract, um, esophagus has slightly different structure of the wall. It still has mucosal layer, which is stratified squamous epithelium. Why? Why it's stratified squamous? Abrasion, yeah, a lot. Food, think about this, food is still pretty rough, okay? In submucosa, there are esophageal glands. Essentially, they produce uh, mucus secretion that lubricates the esophagus and allows food to easier come through. Muscularis, okay? <clears throat> this part is the muscularis externa, two layers. On this layer, you can see... Um, circular and longitudinal layers, that's the lower esophagus. So in the inferior part, it's a smooth muscle. In the middle, it's the mixture of skeletal and smooth. And here it's skeletal. Uh, don't let the fact that it's skeletal muscle trick you. You still have no control of the esophageal muscles. Does that make sense? They are structurally skeletal, but they are controlled involuntarily. Does that make sense? So far, you can see mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa. The only difference, real difference, adventitia. So this fibrous layer, here you can see adventitia in that um, Micrograph. Uh, this fibrous layer, the adventitia, it attaches esophagus to the surrounding tissues. Basically, you know, um, hangs it up in your thoracic cavity. So far, are we clear? One thing that I want you to, want to point your attention at is this extremely illustrative junction between the esophagus and the stomach. So look at the esophageal epithelium. It's a classic stratified squamous epithelium. You see basal layer and you see multiple layers of non-keratinized cells. As soon as esophagus stops and stomach starts, Epithelium changes to simple columnar. Okay, so in the nutshell, esophagus is responsible for propulsion, peristalsis. It has non keratinized stratified squamous epithelium in the mucosa. It has some skeletal muscle on top and in the middle. And it doesn't have cirrhosis, it has adventition. Any questions? Go ahead. So that picture is like we're looking down into exactly. the correct and yes. like the folds that we're seeing, is that where the sub mucosa and the mucosa like where it says where it's empty whenever it's empty, the mucosa and the sub mucosa form folds, those are those folds. Correct. Yes. And No, that's a good question. No, it's, it doesn't relate to surface area. Surface area is essential when there are absorptive processes or secretory, right? When you have to move stuff around. So you need a lot of area to either effectively absorb or effectively secrete. In this case, when it's empty, it folds. Like think, of, think about it as the grocery sack. You can take grocery sack fold it and stick it in your pocket but when you fill it with something it kind of i mean it doesn't stretch but it straightens out does that make sense so when we when food enters when food enters the lumen of esophagus those folds just they basically have enough slack to stretch when food gets there 
That's it. That's like all the purpose. Just to get some slack. We clear? Any questions? Okay, so we're moving to the stomach. The first organ with a lot of digestive activities. So let's talk about gross anatomy of the stomach first. Stomach lumen, everybody's comfortable with the word lumen. It's basically the empty space inside, right? So the stomach lumen, or inside stomach surface, whatever, can be divided into four distinct parts, okay? First is cardia. Cardia is located immediately near the gastroesophageal junction. Other two parts of fundus in the body. And then the most distal part, the stomach, part that is closest to the small intestine, is pylorus. Now, pylorus can be subdivided into the pyloric antrum. Antrum meaning like entrance, okay? Pyloric antrum is the entrance into the pylorus. And pyloric canal, the part that is abutted by duodenum right here. Duodenum is the part of the small intestine. Now, pyloric canal, duodenum, are separated by another sphincter, which is called pyloric sphincter. So if we will try to trace the pathway of the food from esophagus through the stomach into the duodenum, we will see that food enters through the gastroesophageal sphincter, gets in the cardia first. From cardia, it will move to fundus in the body, from the body it will reach pyloric antrum and pyloric canal. And if pyloric sphincter is open, it will end up in the duodenum. Does this order make sense to you? In terms of other Questions? Yes. Um, so, for like the pyloric sphincter, is that where you would have issues with kids who had like pyloric stenosis? And what does that like? I was under the impression that had to do with like like GERD kind of. But how if it's at the very bottom? How does that play into GERD if it's the stenosis is when it doesn't shut all the way, right? Or it's No offense. Questions over? I'm gonna no, I'm gonna rephrase. So the question is, what is pyloric stenosis, and why children with pyloric stenosis would have this regurgitation of the foot? First of all, stenosis is narrowing of anything. It can be narrowing of the vessel, narrowing of the tube, basically. In case of pyloric sphincter, pyloric stenosis would be narrowing of either pyloric canal or the sphincter itself, which means it doesn't open wide enough to let the content of the stomach enter the duodenum, which means food stays and builds up in the stomach, which leads to over distension of the stomach, which leads to reflexive contraction of the stomach muscles, you were asking about vomiting, overstretch of the stomach, you know, when people overeat, or like, I mean, next level, okay, they can throw up, because stomach is overextended, and protective reflex is to open gastroesophageal sphincter, upper esophageal sphincter, so the food leaves, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, you there is a you can basically point at the uh, root of your tongue. There are nerve endings. When you press on them, they will stimulate the vomiting center in the dueling throw up. Like two fingers in the throat. Hmm? Have you ever tried it? Huh? Forcing vomiting. Especially when you like well, when you intoxicated, huh? <laughs> when you what? Oh, no, not when you're hungover, when you're drunk. In order to not get terribly hungover, you force vomiting because that's basically you force the poison, which ethanol is poison by chemical means, by biological means, it's, it's a poison. You force that poison out of the system to at least reduce the symptoms of, you know, in the morning. Yes. That I don't know. I would say that it might be a habituation. Uh, the one that we discussed, you know, people get used to pain, people get used to the sensations. So that would be my speculation, but I'm not, I don't have an answer. What about like morning sickness? Oh, that's some chemical. I don't really know the exact chemistry, but chemicals can cause vomiting. Like when you have motion sickness, certain neurotransmitters stimulate vomiting center. So you can basically, uh, um, a lot of anti-vomiting drugs, they inhibit the signal that goes to medulla oblongata, so you don't throw up, okay? Mm. Now, um, I'm surprised nobody asked anything about this sphincter here, which is gastroesophageal sphincter responsible for the reflex. Some people, it doesn't close all the way, and in children, it cannot close all the way for quite a long time. So if you take a, a younger kid and turn them around and shake them well, they will give the food away. I mean, not really well, but to some extent. I did. I almost did that with my nephew when he was seven. We played and I flipped him upside down and said, put me back because I'm about to kind of let it go. Um, and I put him down, he's fine. She's not like vomiting or throwing up, it's just, yes. This reflex, like closing, develops with age. Uh, but sometimes when, especially there is some irritant or you do some physical activity on the full stomach, um, you're basically shaking your stomach and protective effect is to open it. It doesn't open that that much, but the content of the stomach shoots into the esophagus and leads to that gastroesophageal reflux, irritation, um, and Actually, if gastroesophageal reflux is left untreated, it is believed that it can lead to esophageal cancer because of inflammation in the esophagus. It's kind of you tricking your stomach. Uh, by shaking it, it, it overstretches a little bit and protect. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna let it out. Yes. Uh, uh, so why people why people throw up if they run really hard for a long time? I don't know the chemical physiological mechanism for it. It's probably because of exertion, but I don't know the exact chemical signal for vomiting. It may be maybe um, some I don't know the exact stimulation. Of now, some other uh, anatomical features of the stomach that are worth mentioning. Well, basically, like terminologically, lesser and greater curvature. Just, you know, you can say the greater curvature, the lesser curvature. Stomach, when it's empty, it's actually folded like a grocery sack. And it's folded, the folds are called rugae. Okay? So you can see this, this folds, mucosal folds. Okay, on the surface of the stomach. Now, um, this picture is technically incorrect. 
because if you look at the stomach, this stomach, it is definitely stretched out. So there should be no folds of the mucosa. But artists perhaps had no other way to demonstrate all of the features, so artists pictured the folds. Well, not directly, not directly esophagus to the um, intestines, but basically uh, a large portion of the stomach gets isolated from the rest of it. So basically the stomach volume becomes really tiny. It, it, there is a lot of problems with gastric bypass surgery, mainly because a lot of people who get it, the success rate is really low because people who get it, um, they usually morbidly abuse, like really bad, and they do not... If they don't change the eating habits, it stretches and grows and just goes back to the same story. Okay. Um, now, so that was gross enough. Does that make sense? So those folds, um, did those have anything to do with the hysteria? Nope. Just same, same, like, same as esophagus. Just, okay. It just folds because it's empty. And when it's full, it stretches. Those folds allow to stretch. Now, uh, more mic microscopic anatomy. So on the tissue level, stomach has all typical four layers, mucosa, submucosa, muscularis externa, serosa. Uh, now, mucosa is simple columnar epithelium. You can see epithelium here. You can see that uh, mucosa is folded very much. But it's folded in slightly different way, Aaron. It's not what you ask. It's not like gross folds. You see that these depressions, these crypts in the mucosa, they form, those are called gastric glands. So each of this, so this is a single gastric gland. Do you see that? I highlighted it. So these gastric glands produce gastric secretions, which we will address shortly, okay? that make sense? Now, <clears throat> submucosa contains nervous plexus, that gut brain that we mentioned before. But muscularis externa is different. So if you would look at the composition of muscularis externa, you will see that they're not two, but three layers of the smooth muscle. Longitudinal, the outermost, circular, and oblique. So essentially, longitudinal and circular are perpendicular to each other. And oblique is at an angle. And this three layers of the smooth muscle in the muscularis externa of the stomach are necessary for the vigorous churning and mixing activities. Food in the stomach is heavily digested. It's basically turned into a mush before this mush, what we call kim, can enter duodenum. So food spends in the stomach two to three hours, and during those two to three hours, there's three layers of the smooth muscle do a lot of work. Does that make sense? Cirrhosis is just cirrhosis, you know. Lubrication and protection. Moving on. So, what kinds of cells are exactly present in the gastric glands the stomach? Well, First and foremost, the mucus cells. Mucus cells are closest to the surface, and they produce thick mucus that has pH over 7. You know by now, I'm pretty sure, that stomach contains acid. So this thick alkaline mucus protects cells epithelial cells of the stomach mucosa 
from the damage. Okay. The cells, the mucus cells, are connected by tight junctions, which prevents the damage to the tissues under the epithelium from the acid and digestive enzymes. You can imagine, though, that these mucus cells can really easily be destroyed, die, because of all that environmental insult that they experience every second. So these cells do indeed die, and mucosa of epithelium is renewed every three to six days. Basically, there's a bunch of stem cells that constantly divide, produce new mucus cells that take place of the dead ones. Does that make sense? Now, here are gastric glands. So, the main function of the gastric gland is to produce gastric juices, which contain two essential chemicals for the stomach digestion. The enzyme called pepsin and the chemical called hydrochloric acid. Okay? Does that make sense so far? So these two chemicals, sorry, hydrochloric acid and pepsin are the most important chemicals that digest, that perform chemical digestion in the stomach. Now, interestingly enough, if you would look at the stomach as a whole, you will see that different parts of the stomach produce slightly different gastric juices. Let's talk about this. So, cardia here, I highlighted it black. And pylorus, especially pyloric canal, they contain mostly mucus cells that produce just mucus and nothing else. Does that make sense? Just mucus. If you look at the pyloric antrum, the green one, Pyloric antrum contains endocrine cells that produce hormone called gastrin, which regulates stomach activity. And only fundus and body, I highlighted them with red, these two parts, the fundus and the body, they produce most of the gastric juices. Now, why is that so? Think about this. Cardia is the place where food enters the stomach from the esophagus. Are you following me? Okay. Therefore, it passes it through really quickly. So there's no point of producing hydrochloric acid and pepsin in the cardia. On top of that, if there is any spillover event from cardia into the esophagus, we want as little hydrochloric acid as possible. Does that make sense? So those cells, the cardia, cardia is basically a hallway, a foyer for the stone. Now, fundus and body, this is where actual digestion happens. And then, as the food moves forward, towards the pylorus, pyloric antrum and pyloric canal, at this point, it's too late to digest it. It's either going to be returned back into the fundus and the body, or it will enter the duodenum, you know? And just as with cardia, there is sort of, we don't want any ex uh, excessive hydrochloric acid to be produced in the vicinity of the duodenum. We don't want hydrochloric acid to get into the duodenum just for the sake of it. Does that make sense? So basically what happens in the stomach, digest, digestion, chemical digestion is confined to the central part of it. While the, the entrance, 
cardio. And the exit, pylorus. Do not participate in the digestion that much. So far, we good? Sorry for the voice. I think I'm getting cold. Like the disease cold. I'm not getting cold. I'm getting sick. <clears throat> so, which cells produce digestive chemicals? So parietal cells, terminally differentiated cells, basically, very specialized, produce hydrochloric acid. This is the chemical, the acid, that gives the stomach its acidity, pH 3. It also necessary for the activation of pepsin. See, hydrochloric acid activates pepsin. It denatures proteins. Another function of parietal cell is to produce protein called intrinsic factor. Intrinsic factor is necessary for binding of vitamin B12. It's quite a cool story. Some people uh, that genetically do not produce intrinsic factor suffer from a condition known as pernicious anemia. Vitamin B12 isn't absorbed in the stomach of those people, and fast dividing cells cannot divide fast. Vitamin B12 is essential for quickly dividing cells, especially for production of red blood cells. So B12 deficiency leads to anemia. When those folks, when it was identified that they do not produce enough red blood cells due to the B12 deficiency, uh, first attempt was done to basically give them a load of vitamin B12 and it didn't work because they couldn't absorb it. And then scientists gave them intrinsic factor isolated, I believe, from the cow's stomach and that worked. So exogenous intrinsic factor allowed them to bind vitamin B12 and absorb it and treat it their anemia. In addition to parietal cells, there are chief cells that produce protein called pepsinogen. Now here on top you can see how pepsinogen gets activated and becomes an enzyme pepsin. Okay. So pepsinogen can be activated either by hydrochloric acid or by pepsin itself. To give an idea of what pepsin as an enzyme can do, if you take a piece of meat, put it in the tube, and pour over basically a solution of pepsin, acidified solution of pepsin, Eventually, it will completely digest it, break it down. Okay, it's an enzyme that is responsible for um, breaking down proteins. Okay, pepsin is what we call a protease. Now, mucus neck cells right here. We don't know their function. They produce acidic mucus very thin, which function is absolutely unclear. And finally, the bottom of the gastric glands usually are enteroendocrine cells. So entero refers to the digestive tract and endocrine well refers to hormones. As you remember, stomach is the secondary endocrine organ. So it produces a bunch of hormones, including, not limited to, gastrin. You need to know the functions of the cells that we just described. Match the cell and the function. Am I clear? Good? Cool. 
stomach hormones. When I say stomach hormones, I mean hormones that are produced by stomach. So which ones? First and foremost, gastric. So it is produced mainly by pyloric antrum, the part of the stomach that is closest to the duodenum. Now look what stimulates the release of gastrin from the stomach. Presence of peptides and amino acids. In the normal people words, pep peptides and amino acids, what do they refer to? What should be in the stomach? Food. Gastrin is released in response to food, mainly proteins, being in the stomach. Does that make sense? Now, remember negative feedback. If you have food in a certain part of alimentary tract, what do you need to do with that food? Break it down. Digest it. So gastrin will stimulate digestive activities, such as secretion by gastric glands, read hydrochloric acid and pepsinogen, clear? It will promote gastric emptying, read contraction of these muscles and pushing the foot into the duodenum. So far, are you following me? It will act on the small intestine, leading to contraction of the intestinal muscles, which will push the, for, the food towards the anus. Does that make sense? Like pushing food forward. Are we clear? It will open ileocecal valve, the sphincter between the small and the large intestine. And it will stimulate powerful contractions of the large intestine called mass movements. Now, let's try to take a look at this, at these effects, in their entirety. <clears throat> Food is in the stomach. As Justin said, what is the response to food being present in the stomach? The D word. Di digestion. Now, food gets digested. Where does it move next from the stomach? Huh? Du duodenum, small intestine. There is possibly, you know, food in the small intestine as well. So, if the new portion comes in, <clears throat> what are you supposed to do with the old portion? Push it down, push it towards the large intestine. There you go. You're pushing it down. But the small and the large intestine are separated by the ileocecal valve. So in order for that food, well, it's not food anymore, but let's call it a food. It's easier. In order for that food, quote unquote, to get from small intestine to the large intestine, what do you need to, to do with that valve? Open it. Is there a chance there are some feces in the large intestine? Sure thing, they take, they take space. You need to get rid of them. So let's squeeze the large intestine and push the feces out. That's your mass movement. How many of you notice that if you have a really good meal, sometime you need to go number two? There it is. Food gets into the stomach stimulates gastrin and the whole system starts pushing stuff out yes oh you mean ibs inflammatory bowel syndrome yeah. uh, so in ibs i i will try to do to, to be brief here it's different mechanism in inflammatory bowel syndrome or inflammatory bowel disease the mucosa of the large intestine mostly, uh, it's mostly, well, it can be ileum, <coughs> the, the distant part, distal part of the small intestine, or it can be any part of the, of the colon. Mucosa is 
very, very inflamed. Meaning that cells are basically dysfunctional. They cannot normally absorb ions, mainly sodium, and water. So if all that water that was supposed to be absorbed stays in the colon, the person develops what? Diarrhea, right? And it comes out. So basically that inflammation stimulates the smooth muscles in the colon. You constantly have diarrhea. That's the reason. It's more about inflammation. Yes? Um, either, uh, I mean, is all of that still happening? Yes, just very, very slow. And you can have some neurological damage that may lead to constipation if there are no signals from the spinal cord stimulating the uh, smooth muscle contraction. Um, or it can be just a structure of food. It'll really, really dense. Also, we kind of talk about digestion without mentioning microorganisms in, um, in, in the colon, may, mainly in the cecum, but they play an enormous role. Um, well, actually, when we'll, when we'll get to this, uh, I still hope my wife can give me some pictures of mice with and without microorganisms in the intestines. But um, let's put it this way, they are critically important for proper peristalsis and proper digestion. We're good with gastrin. Uh, ghrelin, hormone of hunger, uh, produced by fundus um, when stomach is empty, um, stimulates hunger. So stomach's empty, you want to eat. That's it. That's normal. Okay. Histamine. As we will see, uh, histamine is an essential step on stimulating the release of hydrochloric acid. Damn it. This fancy rectangle shifted again. Okay. Serotonin. leads to the contraction of the smooth muscles of the stomach. So, so far you can see, except for ghrelin, gastrin, uh, serotonin, and histamine, all participate in increased stomach activity. Does that make sense? Now, you have to remember that the majority of regulation in the human body is built on the teeter-totter. Uh, principle. Something goes up, okay, some, you know, system changes like a pendulum and then goes back to the previous state and then goes back to that change state and kind of moves between two states like a, like a dieter tot. okay? So the hormone that inhibits all the digestive activities in this case is somatostatin. This is one word name for the hypothalamic hormone. It's produced also in the hypothalamus. So it's a hormone that can be found in the hypothalamus as well. This hormone is called growth hormone, inhibiting hormone, G-H-I-H. Somato, body, statin, stop. So growth hormone, inhibiting hormone, next name for it, Another name for it is somatostatin. Now, somatostatin is produced in the pyloric antrum and the duodenum. Now, if we will go for a second to that image of a stomach in the bottom right corner. So look at the stomach. Where is pyloric antrum? It's here. At this point, food is about to enter the duodenum, right? Duodenum is well in the duodenum. 
So these parts of digestive or alimentary canal, they produce somatostatin to regulate the digestive activity and inhibit digestive activity of a stomach. Think about it this way. If we wouldn't have that inhibitory hormone, then the time it would take us to digest and most importantly transfer all the food from mouth to anus would be really short. Does that make sense? It would be just flying through the stomach. Gastrin would stimulate all these secretions. Serotonin would stimulate stomach contractions and churning. Um, gastrin would stimulate the activity of the small intestine and the large intestine. Food would be just passing through. Does that make sense? Which wouldn't leave enough time for proper chemical digestion. Does that make sense? So you want to leave the food, well, quote unquote, the food, in the stomach and in the small intestine for the time that's sufficient for enzymes and hydrochloric acid and whatnot, bile salts, to digest, break down these large molecules like triglycerides and carbohydrates and proteins. Does that make sense? So, yes, gastrin will kind of force the food into the duodenum and then some other statin will shut it down for a time and then gastrin will force it back again some other statin will shut it down so these two hormones gastrin and somatostatin essentially work like two like tug of war sort of in the tug of war normal tug of war so they will regulate the retention time in the stomach they will regulate the passage of food through the alimentary tract does that make sense so far gastrin stimulates the emptying gastrin actually increases digestive activities of the stomach secretion and churning. Somatostatin inhibits all gastric secretions and gastric churning. So they opposing each other. Does that make sense? That's the idea. Now, that opposition between them allows stomach to regulate the amount of food that enters into the duodenum at a given time and the time that food stays in the stomach. Does that make sense? So it has enough time to get digested. Good? Um, now, chemical digestion in the stomach. So gastrin, this is the sequence that you have to know. Gastrin here is released by the G cells. It is released either in the response of the local stimuli or it can be released in response to what we call vagal stimulation. It's called vagovagal reflex. When you put the food in your mouth, you taste it. Is that clear? The taste of food stimulates the digestion center in the medulla oblongata, which sends the motor output through the vagus nerve to the G cell, leading to the release of gastrin. So gastrin starts, gets to be released before the food gets in the stomach by this vagal stimulation. Does that make sense to you? So it kind of prepares the whole thing for digestion. Does that make sense? Now, gastrin enters the circulation and eventually reaches ECL cell. ECL stands for enterochromaffin like. I don't care what it's. Remember the acronym ECL cells. Now, ECL cells 
produce histamine. Histamine acts on the parietal cell, and parietal cell secretes hydrochloric acid. Does that make sense? Quick question. Gastrin responds to various stimulations associated very various stimuli associated with food being in the stomach. Does that make sense? So gastrin is produced in response to food in the stomach, stimulates ECL cells. ECL cells release histamine. Histamine acts on the parietal cell. Hydrochloric acid is released. Food is in the stomach, right? So this whole thing keeps going and going and going and going. So hydrochloric acid gets accumulated in the stomach. What happens to the stomach pH? It goes down, right? Acidity goes up, but pH goes down. Will it go down indefinitely? Because what kind of feedback? Negative feedback. Turns out that low pH in the stomach will inhibit G cells. Does that make sense? So that has nothing to do with the Oh, it's just a, just a different mechanism. It's just a different mechanism. There, there are like several mechanisms. We have to look at each mechanism separately, but there are many of them. Yes? So, I'm going to draw over the pictures. So you've got food, right, which stimulates G cells. Now, G cells release what? Gastrin. Gastrin stimulates ECL cells, which release histamine, which stimulates parietal cells, which release hydrochloric acid. Now, hydrochloric acid breaks down food, but it also, look, it inhibits G cells. That makes sense too. Now imagine your normal pH in the stomach is about three. Okay, you eat something. Not it's like something, something. I don't know, bread. Okay. How is it going to change the pH? Initial, the moment food gets in there, just the moment the food gets in there, it's going to go up because it's going to dilute the acid. Does that make sense? The concentration of acid will initially fall. So when food falls in your stomach, pH goes up. We clear? pH goes up. Gastrin gets released. So this whole chain of events happens. Hydrochloric acid is released. pH starts to go down. When it reaches about 2, it inhibits G cells, so gastrin doesn't get released. If you keep eating, pH starts to climb. At some point, inhibition goes away, gastrin gets released. Does that make sense? Again, teeter totter. You know, stimulus comes, stimulus goes. Does that make sense? Now, we're going to talk about chemistry. I believe I can predict the um, how you like chemistry majority of you I don't know but I presume you just love the science it's going to be super simple chemistry but it, the processes that we're going to talk about are foundational and really important for many physiological uh, processes like we're gonna run into this later when we talk about pancreatic digestion we're gonna talk uh, run into it 
when we will talk about respiratory system. We will run into it when we will talk about renal system. So this set of reactions is really crucial. Basically, we have a task. We need to make acid. So the only source of acidity that we have in the body is carbon dioxide. Clear? So here what happens in the prenatal cells. Carbon dioxide diffuses from the blood into the prenatal cell. And carbon dioxide freely diffuses all the time. And CO2 combines with water. The enzyme called carbonic anhydrase stimulates the formation of carbonic acid, H2CO3. Carbonic acid dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate ion. Do you see those two? I highlighted them with red. Hydrogen ion is essentially an acid. Am I clear? If that makes sense. Hydrogen ion is acid. So hydrogen ion gets transported into the lumen of intestine, while bicarbonate goes back in the blood. So bicarbonate in the blood serves as the acidity buffer. It, it is bicarbonate buffer is the main buffer in the blood. Now my question for you is, how does hydrogen get from the parietal cell into the lumen of the stomach? If I said before intestine, I'm sorry I misspoke. So how does hydrogen ion get from parietal cell into the stomach lumen. Does it do it by diffusion or by active transport? Hmm? Active transport. Can you tell me why? Don't tell me because it's written on the slide. No? Okay. Hydrogen ions. Hydrogen ion is the acid. What is normally the pH in the lumen of the stomach? Acidic. So, yeah, acidic. So, got to transport acid from prenatal cell into a place with a ton of acid. You would transport along the gradient or against the gradient? Against, right? Because you're going to transport in the area with even higher acidity. Does that make sense? So this is the reason this pump here, the ATPase that pumps the hydrogens, okay, into the stomach, into the lumen of the stomach, can concentrate hydrogen by three, four orders of magnitude. Now, I just noticed there's a typo here. Obviously, the transport of hydrogen into the lumen of the stomach doesn't increase pH, okay? It decreases pH. Is that clear? Simply type, I put the wrong arrow. Does it make sense, that story? So carbon dioxide, now talk, talk to me. Carbon dioxide diffuses into the parietal cell. What does it react with? Water. What acid is formed? Carbonic acid, H2CO3. Which enzyme facilitates that reaction? Carbonic anhydrase. Carbonic acid, H2CO3. What does it dissociate into? Hydrogen and bicarbonate. Bicarbonate goes where? Into blood. Hydrogen goes where? Stomach lumen. And it goes into the stomach lumen how? 
by active transport, by pump. Does that make sense? If you know the steps, a couple of questions on the exam are yours. Okay, I will ask about those steps. Have you heard about the drug called omeprazole? That's the protein pump inhibitor. It treats, you know, increase the acidity of the stomach and used to treat, we will talk about soon, condition known as peptic ulcer. It inhibits pumping of hydrogens into the stomach lumen. Does that make sense? Are we clear? Now, that's, I promise, I will not ask you about how chloride anion is transported. Don't worry about this. Okay, so what we spelled out now, you have to know that. Almost like, not singly. I'm not going to ask you about, you know, chloride bicarbonate and type order at the um, basal surface of the parietal cell. Don't worry about it. Okay, but I want you to understand the idea of how hydrogen and bicarbonate are formed because it's going to be crucial later. Am I clear? Any questions? Enzymes. There are two. Pepsin, as we figured. Um, produced by chief cells. Substrate for this enzyme are proteins. And the product of the enzymatic reactions are peptides. So proteins being broken into smaller pieces. And the second enzyme is gastric lipase, produced by same chief cells. The substrate is triglycerides, butter, vegetable oils, and the products are fatty acids and monoglycerides. That make sense? We good? Before we move on, which, so we have three main energy bearing nutrients, which are carbohydrates, fats, proteins, which two are digested in the mouth? Hmm? Fats and carbs, yes, fats and carbs, which two are digested in the stomach? Fats and proteins, yes. This is something that you need to know. I'm going to ask this. Which are digested where? You know. Am I clear? Um, mechanical digest, uh, digestion, churning. Um, so this is what happens. Look. This is, this is why I call it food, quote unquote. If you believe every person in this room threw up at least once in their lives, right? So you know how it looks. It looks kind of like food, but not like food, okay? Especially if it was sitting there for a while. Does that make sense? So this semi-digested food is called kim. The skim approaches pylorus, and then here's the deal. You can eat a lot. So imagine like you have a really generous meal. I don't know. You have two slices of pizza and two cans of Diet Coke. Really terrible meal, but volume-wise, it's, it's a lot, right? Now... It gets in your stomach, gets all mixed up, and, you know, get turns into that slushy kim. And then, every time kim approaches pylorus, only about three milliliters of kim actually enters into the duodenum. Really small portion. The rest of it is returned and makes another circle through the stomach. Does that make sense? So it kind of is moved around, moved around, and every time, with every wave, only about three milliliters enter the intestines. Does that make sense? 
So intestines every time except really small amount. And we will see why this is so important. Okay, so intestines can effectively complete the digestion and, and complete the absorption. Make sense? Now, interestingly enough, when Kim enters the duodenum here, it actually decreases emptying of the stomach. Called decreased gastric emptying. That makes sense. Kind of slows them down. And that brings us to the conversation about the regulation of gastric secretions. Now this is quite elaborate scheme, but a lot of it we already covered. So there are three phases that regulate gastric secretion. And as with any secretion, you can either stimulate it or inhibit it. Before we move forward, is that understood? You can stimulate the secretion or you can inhibit it. You can increase the secretion or you can decrease it. Are we clear? Now, this is, in my opinion, this whole regulation is really straightforward common sense day-to-day -day experience story. Let's talk about stimulatory effects. First phase is cephalic. It refers to the central nervous system, right? So this cephalic phase happens when you start your meal. So you sit at the table and you have plate in front of you. We're clear. You see this food, smell it, and eventually you taste it. So all these stimuli, taste, smell, you know, view, they stimulate your stomach eventually by a vagus nerve. Does that make sense? So once you put it in your mouth, it goes through the hypothalamus and vagus nerve to the stomach, and it increases gastric secretions. Does that make sense? It stimulates production of gastric, stimulates release of hydrochloric acid, stimulates the release of pepsin. Am I clear? Does that make sense? Dear? So that stimulates your gastric secretions. Now, what about sight and thought of food? Do you have any food that you despise? Just hate? Probably. You know. So if you will get the plate of whatever it is in front of you, you're not going to be super excited. Does that make sense? Your digestive activities will not be really stimulated. Because that part, the actual appreciation of what you're eating, goes through the cerebral cortex. Okay? So I don't know, if you uh, you walk in the grocery store and you're really hungry, and you look at you know, kale, whatever, and then you get, you know, I don't know, for me it would be like a meat roll. That's the different story, okay? So whatever whatever you prefer. For somebody who's vegetarian, it can be completely different. Does that make sense? So that's conscious appreciation. But nevertheless, during the cephalic phase, it's going to be smell, taste, anything that is sensed by the parts of your head. Are we clear? Then comes gastric phase. So in the gastric phase, basically presence of food in the stomach. Food chemicals and stomach distension. Does that make sense? So stomach, food gets in the stomach, stomach gets distended, stretched. Is that clear for you? This activates what we call vagal-vagal reflex going through the medulla back by a vagus nerve stimulating gastric secretions. The local level 
distension works as well and food chemicals okay as we discussed food gets in the stomach increases pH gastric food enters to the stomach and food chemicals react with the receptors on the epithelium gastric food enters coffee enters into the stomach reacts with the adenosine receptors gastric does that make sense to you so it's look it's straightforward we just put it in a scientific form but in fact it's all about you know food that needs to be digested Does that make sense? The third phase is intestinal. Now, with intestinal phase, it's kind of interesting because stimulatory activities, okay, from intestinal phase are short term. When chemo enters duodenum for a very brief period of time. It leads to the release of gastrin into the blood and that gastrin will stimulate the secretory and mechanical digestion in the stomach. Does that make sense? So in a really Poor analogy. You ask someone, you know, somebody gives you things, I don't know, whatever, and you tell this person, come on, come on, hurry up. This is what intestine here, in that brief release of gastrin, tells to the stomach, come on, hurry up, move the chemo. Over. Does that make sense? But, and we're going to move to the inhibitory phase. In the long-term sense, effects of the intestine are inhibitory. Think about this. When Kim entered the intestine, what should happen to the Kim in the intestine? Huh? Broken down. Yeah, look, if I'm if I'm gonna ask you a hard question, I will tell you about this. Broken down. Clear? What is easier to break down? Three mils or 300 mils? Three mils. So, three milliliters of chem is enough for intestine to take care at a given moment. Make sense? So, in the long term perspective, presence of chem in the intestine will lead to the release of various hormones and stimulation of so-called extragastric reflex, which will slow down the secretory activities in the stomach and will slow down the mechanical digestion. Does that make sense? So using that same fairly poor analogy, I'm asking someone, come on, come on, give me, give me. That's enough, that's it, that's it, let me deal with it. I will ask you again, a little bit later. So this is what intestine does. Upon the chem entering the intestine, it releases, intestine releases the, the, the hormone, the gastric, which stimulates stomach. Come on, give me, give me back. Give me skin here. Eventually, this really brief effect goes away and intestine starts to release different hormones here like secretin cholecystokinin that will act on the stomach inhibiting it saying okay I've got enough let me deal with what I have and I will call you back yes so that kind of like the delayed cold feeling can um mechanisms it's a good analogy Mechanisms are different though. When uh, that later fulfilling, it's the leptin response. This is what, when your adipose tissue starts to produce leptin, 
it hits hypothalamus, it takes time. But when it hits hypothalamus, you realize, okay, I'm not hungry anymore, I'm fine. But the idea is, the, the analogy is good because that Kim is keep coming, it's keeping coming, you know, but eventually there's basically too much and the intestine says, no, 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 shut it down, keep it to yourself, you need to deal with what I have. Does that make sense? We're clear. Now, what are inhibitory events at the cephalic and the gastric phases? Um, cephalic, depression, loss of appetite. You don't want to eat. That's psychological. Does that make sense? In the gastric, mainly excess facility. We just discussed it with you. Remember? When we talked, you know, gastrin keeps stimulating the release of hydrochloric acid. pH drops, pH goes below 2, it inhibits gastrin secretion. Are we clear? Now, what do you want to focus on when you study this? I would suggest break it down and think about it this way. So what are the cephalic stimuli? Stimuli for the stomach. Sight, smell, taste of food, right? So if you put something in your mouth, what's going to happen to the gastric secretion? It's going to go up. We, you got this, you move on, you say, okay, what's going to be the inhibitory stimuli in the gastric phase? First and foremost, acidity. If pH is too low, means too much hydrochloric acid is produced, meaning we have to shut down gastric secretions. Does that make sense? If you break it down this way, like, okay, what stimulates, are there any stimulatory effects uh, produced by intestine? Yes, but they're short term, okay? Mediated by gastrin right here. Mainly intestine is inhibitory in the long term perspective. So, Type of questions, you will see it, but type of questions that I can ask about this is something like, which of the following will be a stimulatory, um, stimulatory event of the cephalic phase? And I can tell you, it's going to be taste of food, lack of appetite, presence of food in the stomach, or presence of food in the intestine. You think, okay, cephalic phase, head, right? So presence of food in the stomach or presence of food in the intestine is just BS. We can get rid of it because it's not head. We have lack of appetite and taste of food. Lack of appetite is inhibitory. Taste of food is stimulatory. Does that make sense? Kind of this. You got a gist? Now, this flow chart basically shows the same story in slightly different ways. So that's a long-term regulation by intestine. Kim enters duodenum from the stomach. That stimulates the secretion of hormones from the intestine that inhibit gastric emptying. And the stretch stimulates the local reflexes that will inhibit gastric emptying as well. You have to remember though that you know intestinal phase they have short-term effect which is stimulatory and long-term which is inhibitory. That makes sense here. Now let's talk about this fun fact and then we'll take a break okay we're gonna have like a shorter second half. Um, Main problem with the stomach, most common gastric ulcer. Um, fairly rare is the tumor, that is tumor of G cells. When G cells overgrow, okay, they produce a lot of gastrin. A lot of gastrin means a lot of histamine. A lot of histamine means uh, a lot of acid. But in this case, you can see that we need to address the tumor first. H. pylori, 
is the main cause, the gastric ulcer. So, two Australian scientists, Marshall and Warren, can never remember, one of them was microbiologist, one of them was physician. They noticed that in biopsies of patients with gastric ulcers, they often found a microorganism called Helicobacter pylori. So it turns out, and they spent almost a year trying to grow it in the lab, and they finally managed to, but they couldn't prove that H. pylori causes gastric ulcer. It didn't work in mice. So then one of them, and I don't remember who it was, one of those, either Marshall or Warren, they, one of them got the beaker of the culture, the bacterial culture, and drank it. And several days later, yeah, it doesn't taste good. The can smells also. But he drank it, and a few days later, he developed um, a proper symptoms of H. pylori, okay? And uh, proper symptoms of gastric ulcer. Uh, his stomach was biopsied. He had ulcer. All the pathology was like textbook pathology, so he proved causation. And since then, it's the main cause of gastric ulcer, H. pylori. And another proof that it does cause um, cancer, uh, not cancer, the ulcer, is that when you treat it, you treat it with uh, not only hydrogen pump inhibitors, but also with antibiotics. So you get rid of that bacteria, you get better. Turns out bacteria doesn't really like uh, your stomach. It tries to burrow away. It dissolves mucus and burrows into the epithelium of your stomach. But that dissolution of mucus leads to the development of an ulcer where acid and digestive enzymes break things down. And that's how it starts. Ulcer is the risk factor for gastric cancer, stomach cancer. Um, if ulcer is uh, penetrating, okay, perforating ulcer, then it's a life-threatening condition. One of my classmates from high school died in 24. He was diagnosed with perforating ulcer, died next day, because content of the stomach spilled into the abdominal cavity, abscess, sepsis, his death. Um, other things associated with um, stomach, you know, gastritis, it's the main, one of the main side effects of using non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs like aspirin or um, ibuprofen or Tylenol. If you use them long enough, they inhibit synthesis of chemicals known as prostaglandins. Prostaglandins regulate the production of bicarbonate in mucus. Basically, they regulate the production of that protective thick alkaline mucus. If prostaglandins are down, so is mucus. Your epithelium is not well protected against acid. You have gastritis. Stop taking them. Go fine. Does that make sense? Any questions? Okay, let's take a break.